This is the Bethel Business Podcast, brought to you by the Bethel Chamber of Commerce in Bethel, Connecticut, and produced by Smith Douglas Associates. Hello again. Today we are with Kim Ramsey at the Toy Room on Greenwood Avenue in Bethel, Connecticut. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks for coming today. Thank you. How long has the Toy Room been here? This is our 11th year. So we opened in 2006, and, and I don't know where the time's gone. It's flown by. <laughs> what made you decide to open a toy store here in Bethel? Well, there always was a toy store here when I was growing up. So we had people either know it by Apollo Imports or Creative Toy Maker, and they closed down a few years before we opened, and I missed that. I, I had a young child. I wanted to get cool, interesting, fun, different toys, and one day driving home from my part-time job at the mall, I walked into the house and I said to my husband, I'm like, a toy store. I'm opening a toy store. And that was that. With Amazon, Target, Walmart, all these other places that sell cheap Chinese toys, mm -hmm. how do you differentiate? What do you stock that people can't find elsewhere? Well, a lot of the companies I purchase items from are very in tune to us small guys. They know that we're kind of the bread and butter behind their organization. They were once small people too starting up, so they really kind of appreciate working with the small businesses. Some of them do also sell to the big box stores, but a lot of times they'll have items that are exclusive for us small guys, for the mom and pop stores. So I try to look for unique merchandise. I try to look for the small startup companies. I try to find educational without it being too educationally. And, uh, and I just, I choose what I like and I hope that that sticks with the customers. Do your customers ask you to carry certain things? They do, they do, yeah, a lot of times. And sometimes it's great. Sometimes they'll know something that I don't know anything about. And, and there have been a couple of times where I've picked up a line because a customer has recommended it or has seen it in a toy store somewhere else or their daughter or son got it as a gift and they loved it. And that's always nice. A lot of the requests I get are for the, um, the more licensed merchandise, like, oh, don't you have Legos, any Dora the Explorer, any Paw Patrol? And those are the kind of things I don't really get into. Those are definitely more the mass market ones. I can't compete with their prices. I can't compete with their assortment. So I just kind of shy away from those. Your store is relatively small, about mm -hmm. 700 square feet. Yes. How do you decide what to stock and how much to stock? Uh, that's always been a challenge. Um, the store is spatially challenged and I love a good puzzle. So somehow or another, my, my Tetris playing skills of my younger years seem to allow me to fit a lot in. I buy what I like and, and my husband would probably appreciate if I listened to his guidance a little bit more as to what to spend and how much to spend in what categories versus where they are popularity wise in the in the sales reports but if i see an open space i do feel the need to the need to fill it a lot of times too it, it becomes a challenge because a lot of the companies the minimum quantities are six ideally four of an item is probably the perfect amount for my store and my shelf but you, know, you got to do what they they want you to do so six i can handle 12 i i don't buy the product if it comes in 12s no rear warehouse <laughs> right no no what you see is what you get and um funny little side story the first couple of years it was definitely a learning curve and i i over ordered quite a bit and uh, took advantage of free shipping deals and and had to get a um, little off-site storage place one holiday season maybe two but definitely one our garage was chocked full of boxes and, um, and my spending was definitely out of control. So, and right about then was when the economy tanked. So it wasn't a good position to be in by any means. Uh, my husband thought the, you know, the, the words of advice and warning kind of went by the wayside. And finally he said, okay, here's the deal. If you're going to order a product, it stays in your store. Nothing else is coming home. And he thought that would curtail it, but where there's a will, there's a way. And I still managed to <laughs> stock it all in here. What are some of the challenges you see in meeting expectations of customers coming in? I think a lot of times it's, well, a lot of my, my core customers and my um, real, like real local come here all the time on their go-to store, they know what to expect. So their expectations are that they're going to come in. They know they're going to find the perfect gift. They know I'll have a great suggestion. They know I'll wrap it and they'll be on their way and it's, it's easy peasy for them. Some of the newer customers that might not be familiar with the toy store or it's their first time here are looking for the more 
mainstream type toys, the Legos, the Disney characters, you know, what ha- have you in that sort of way. And for them, it's a little bit of a learning experience. You know, they always leave with something and they're happy. And nine out of 10 times they come back and are like, oh my gosh, so-and-so loved the gift. It was perfect. I want another one. And, and they come to appreciate the fact that I don't carry what everybody else does. But it is a challenge at first because their face kind of drops when they say, so where are your Legos? And, and I have to say, we don't carry them. And you just see the whole face just, just goes, oh. So you have to be kind of quick with a suggestion. <laughs> If someone does come in saying, my nephew's turning 12, I have no idea what to buy him, Mm -hmm. how do you guide people through? I always have at least one or two items in my brain at all times that are for each age group. So I'll be like, oh, well, this is something that my nephew liked at that age. Or now my youngest is 15, so 12 isn't too far off, so I know what he and his friends would play with. I had my little own focus groups of kids for a while that I could... uh, kind of test with. So I've always got a couple of, of ideas right at the tip of my tongue for uh, for that. Do you stock your shelves by age range, by gender, by type? Uh, definitely more, a little bit age. I start off kind of the birth to two is in one section down on the, on the lower level. And then after that, it turns into sections. It turns into there's a game section, there's craft, science, building, outdoor, pretend play. So then it kind of goes into the interest. So I really try to drive away from the gender because I just know too from my own experience with kids, it shouldn't matter what kids want to play with. It's really, you know, my young, my older son was really into crafts and he used to get frustrated because all the craft packaging was geared more towards girly stuff. And I said, who cares if you like it, just do it. It's fun and, and exciting and you get to create something and you can make it your own. So I really try to steer away from that. And I really kind of hate the fact that there's a lot of pink on packaging for girl things. So do you see that changing? I do. I do. And um, some companies have done it right. They'll stay very neutral with their colors. And purple seems to be a very gender neutral color. So purple on a package or in a toy component, say building blocks, for example, Mm -hmm. if they're doing colored building blocks, and they want to come up with some funkier colors aside from your traditional like red, blue, yellow, they'll add in a couple colors. And it's great when they do just a purple and maybe they do an orange and maybe a weird color green and it kind of brings it into a more neutral zone. But then there's the company that will put the pink block in with it too. And that really automatically, even though it's trying to be package neutral, sways girl. It's an immediate switch. Like I have a very hard time selling something that's got pink in it no matter how neutral the packaging is. So they'd be better off sticking to the purple as the, as the kind of the, the traditional, more girly color. That, that should be the extreme of it. And they shouldn't try to package all the colors in and force everybody to play with them. Do you go to the big toy shows down in New York City? I do, I do. So every February we're at Toy Fair. And the one thing we discovered, we were a little late to discovering it because I think that this particular organization, Astra, has been around at least as long as we have. I'm not sure the exact year they started, but we didn't go to them until this is our third year of hitting up um, Astra, and it's the American Specialty Toy Retailers Association. So it's all us little guys. And that happens in June. So it's kind of nice. You have Toy Fair in New York, which is so local and easy to get to in February. And then come June, you have this other great store that's really just for the small mom and pops. So you're not dealing with the executives from Toys R Us and Target and all those, which is what you have at Toy Fair. And a lot of booths at Toy Fair are kind of, we call them lockdown booths because they're big, they're enclosed. You can't see what's inside. You can't get into them. It's the companies like Mattel, Lego, you can't get near unless you've made an appointment like six months in advance. It's, and they're the ones like, to me, it's not very welcoming. Like, obviously you don't really want my business because I can't even see what you're offering. You're not trying to attract new individuals walking by. Whereas at Astra, everything is open. Every company that, first of all, you see the companies that really are there to help the small mom and pops because they've made the effort to come and it's gotten to be this huge trade show and everybody's on the same playing field. So the booth sizes aren't like, hey, just pay us a bunch of money and you can have the biggest booth you want, which is Javits Center's sort of of way of handling it. This is like, well, these are the options and you can either take it or not. So um, we find the the Astra one to be much more beneficial than the um, Toy Fair. So what do you see are the trends now that so many kids are playing video games Mm -hmm. 
what's getting them away from just staring at a screen? What toys are capturing their imagination? It's kind of interesting because having kids that are 15 and 20, my 20 year old was definitely kind of on the cusp of like, he didn't really get into video games and things like that until he was probably five or six years old. Wasn't really an interest. Not everybody had it. The younger son, on the other hand, was definitely at a younger age. And now you see babies in strollers with iPads already on the technology. So it's kind of interesting to see just in that 20 year time frame how much it's changed. And I find like with my my older son, he only had his game time, but then he also had plenty of toy time. Now it's it's gotten to the point where the kids are on the screens almost immediately from birth. So now when they see a toy, they're like, oh, this is cool. <laughs> it's not like that, that kind of there was a gap for a while where you really kind of had to convince them to play with a toy. But now they think toys are this new, cool, funky thing that's different than video and technology. And so that's been kind of kind of neat. It's it's really become more and the grandparents help feed into that too because they don't want the technology. Some of them don't use it themselves. It's not something they're comfortable with. So they're the ones that'll be like, oh, let's play a game. And all of a sudden the kids are like, what's a board game? Um, so I think board games and crafts are probably the two easiest ways to kind of get the kids away from the screen time and into something fun. What games are your best sellers? Probably any game that I like, because <laughs> games are something a lot of times you have to, um, you really, the person will come in and they'll be looking for a game and you have to kind of explain it to them. They're not really, aside from your traditional, the ones that have been around forever, Monopoly, Scrabble, Life, Sorry, Parcheesi, all of those kind of retro games. The newer games, you know, you're not necessarily familiar with. So there's a couple that, like Ruckus is a game that I've always had. It's a card game. It's super fun. It's fast. You don't need to read for it. Or Tenzi, which is a dice game that a couple of guys down um, Lower Fairfield County created. And that's been a huge hit. And some of the schools use it as a teaching device. Families have turned it into, you know, a regular family time game. You can customize it. So, and it's nice to have that local component. So you say, oh, hey, the guys are right down, you know, 30 minutes drive from here. And, and that's a fun, fun thing. Do you get sales reps from local toy companies hoping you'll carry their I do, stuff? I do. Yeah. And I like to always give it a try. So we have um, probably our closest one is Luke's Toy Company. They're right in Danbury and they make these great little, they've been featured in the paper a couple of times. But they make these great little vehicles that are also puzzles. So you get a base, you get the cab part, you get the back part of whatever truck it is, whether it's a fire truck, a cargo truck, a dump truck, and they're all interchangeable. So if you get a couple um, different ones, you can mix and match, but they're all recycled material that they're made out of. They're made right here in Danbury with USA material. So that's been um, that's been great. It's, it's a win-win. It's local. And when he came in, um, Will's wife came in first. I think maybe three years ago now, and uh, and said, hey, you know, I don't know if you'd be interested. And I'm like, sure. And so he came by and um, and showed me this stuff. And I said, you did everything right. You you're doing an eco friendly toy, made in the U S. And you're right here in Danbury. Like that's <laughs> that's a beautiful thing. So that we've had a great relationship with them. So with the town growing as fast as it is, mm -hmm. do you see within the past decade the changes that come with that growth? Not really. I mean, I think. For us, it's it's we have the the clientele for such a limited amount of time. Like you hope to hold on to them, but the realistic part of it is that usually by age eight, it becomes a hard sell for the toys. So even though I do carry things for that older age range, I kind of see the cyclical eight year trends for family. And now I'm seeing it because I've been in business eleven years. So now I see moms that have come in pregnant that had their babies that are now. The kids are off to school and I'm like, how is that person in middle school already? That can't, can't be happening. But, and it's kind of neat to see. So I have to say, I don't see a huge influx of extra customers from the changes in the growth in the town yet, but who knows? We, we have a lot of building going on in town and a lot of new areas in the, the TOD. And, and so it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next few years. How do you find new customers? <laughs> um, that's not always the easiest thing. Word of mouth is by far the best. Once they come in here and they have the experience and they enjoy it and they tell a friend and they tell a friend and people see it at parties, what a great gift. Oh, I know where that wrapping paper came from. So that's probably my most effective means. 
it's hard. That's changed a lot because it used to be when I started, there was still a lot of print advertising and people were still reading papers and things like that. That's not the case anymore. So it's not really worth it to put money into print a little bit here and there, but certainly not the chunk that it used to be. So social media, I think is probably, I get, if I boost a post for $5 on Facebook, it actually generates quite a bit. So it, it seems to be pretty cost effective and it's my market. You know, the moms are all on Facebook. So as long as they still like Facebook, that's good. Do you <laughs> sell online? I don't at the moment. I've tried. It's always been, part of it's been a time constraint loading up the merchandise to the website to sell it. And then you have the flip side to that is keeping up with the inventory on the website so you're not selling stuff that you don't have in stock. And that's always been a challenge. There are systems that make it easier that can link directly up to my point of sale, but they're kind of pricey. So part of me, even though I know that I should be probably selling online, part of me wants to buy more toys for the store. And so I constantly have that battle. I've tried three different times selling online. And the last time it was kind of interesting because what happened was instead of, instead of people ordering online, they'd say, hey, I saw, you know, you had this online, but do you have something instead for this? So they were looking for items and they were, most of them were relatives of customers that I have. So the relatives might live somewhere else and, and oh, hey, I know my niece or nephew or my grandchild or my granddaughter loves shopping in your store. What can I get for them? And I can do that without an online store. Like they call me now and, and it's fun because it's like, I get the call like, hey, this is so-and-so's grandma. Can you put together a gift? And would you mind dropping it off at the house? Which I'll do if it's close by or can they come in and pick it up? So then they're not paying the shipping and the kid gets to come in. And the best is when they come in and say, there's something waiting for me. And you've got this big package and it's like, oh, so, um, so I don't know that I necessarily need online. So if someone comes in and, oh, I want to buy a gift for my grandchild, can you ship? I can. Yep, we ship. So usually um, either UPS or um, Priority Mail. Priority Mail seems to have some better prices usually, and I know they're getting it in three days. Yeah, so we do a lot of that during the holidays, more so than the other times, but I offer it year-round. I assume Christmas is one of your busiest seasons. Yes. What other times of the year have you been surprised to see a spike in business? July. There is absolutely no other toy store that I'm aware of, according to my reps that come in and visit, that will tell you that July is usually their third busiest month, but it is for us. And I think part of that is there's so many camps that are offered. I think that a lot of people take advantage of that and stay in town here in July and take their vacations either the end of June or August so that their kids have the July experience. There's, we're such a sporty town. There's still a lot of sports happening. And then I think, of course, the, the good old, old-fashioned old sidewalk sales, summer fest event that the town puts on certainly helps. So July is always our third busiest month. Very interesting. Yeah. What's, what's your second busiest month? It probably depends on when Easter is falling. So if Easter's in April, we definitely get a good April out of it. If Easter's at the end of March, eh, it's so-so. So, -so. so um, it's, I think, March, they're still, they still haven't quite recovered from the holidays and the winter doldrums, whereas Easter, when it's in April, is like, woohoo, everybody's happy, and um, it's springtime, and they're in the mood to buy. So I think April does a pretty close uh, fourth place for us. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you sell a lot for birthday gifts. Mm -hmm. What other events do people buy toys for? New babies, new, the, and the, if it's a new baby, the trend has been to get the sibling or sibling something. So it's always a little smaller. Like I usually recommend coloring pages or sticker pads, something like that, that'll keep them happy and occupied while mom might be busy with the baby. Um, but sibling gifts have been a big thing. Party favors I do. I don't know that I keep trying to promote that. I don't know that many people, I still have to get it out there more, I guess, but yeah, people can come in, choose a price range, let me put something together. They can look around, choose things. I think that the party favor idea is, I don't think people want the junk in their bags and the goodie bags anymore. And so it's great that you've got this bag filled with candy and tchotchke things from Oriental Trading, but they all get thrown out on the other end. So I feel like it's always a waste of money. So I've had 
And again, customers have come in. One woman bought the Melissa and Doug does these great sticker books or coloring books, and they're five dollars. So it's like by the time you're done spending that on other things, you're sending the kid home with like a nice big item that they'll use. And so from that, we've done some that usually that five dollar price point seems to be it. But we'll do that. We'll do little. Sometimes we do the little tie stuffed animals with a lollipop. I've had people come in and get gift cards, like five dollar gift cards per kid. And that's been great because then the kids come back in and they're so excited for something so new and unique. Like they just gave me money to go buy something with and they'll come in and choose things and they really work hard to kind of get the best thing that with that $5. So it's adorable to see. What is the top end age range you cater to? Adults. Uh, <laughs> I definitely, games, I go all the way up to adults. So the sky's the limit. Um, the craft stuff, a lot of them will say ages 6 to 96, which is always fun to see. But there's actually one craft company, Ann Williams, and it's a, a woman-owned company, which is kind of fun. And they put that on their packaging, too. And they started out small and have gotten bigger and bigger and bigger every year. And now their packaging, they started doing this 6 to 8 range was kind of their their niche. Then they went up to a lot last year of 12 year old crafts, which was also great and perfect to have. And they're nice. They're things that you'd wear or put in your room and they come out really nice. And now they're doing a whole adult line of crafts. So we'll be getting some of those in for the holidays where you can make home decor items. And, and they really do look professionally done. They've done a great job with their instructions and the materials that they use. And so, yeah, I have to say I'm up to adult now. <laughs> Excellent. So it's not just for kids. Not anymore. just for kids. No, the parents come in. The grandparents have a great time in here because I'll have some of the retro toys like Slinkies, Dunkin' Yo-Yos, all of that, marbles. And so, yeah, so it's really, it's all ages. <laughs> what did you do before opening the, the toy room? I was, well, I've always been in retail, although I was an art history major in college. Go figure. But, and I love retail because it's different every single day. So most of my time was spent working as a manager for Pottery Barn in Williams-Sonoma, um, which gave me great customer service skills because the sky's the limit with them. The training that you get from them is is unmatched by anybody else. So, um, but I'd also been a manager for, an assistant manager for Godiva Chocolatier, which is a fun job when I was in college. That was a great way to uh, to spend some afternoons and evenings in college eating chocolate and pretending you're the boss. So it was really, it was a neat situation. And I was the manager at Crabtree and Evelyn at Rockefeller Center for a while. And um, yeah, so it's always, always had my, my claws in something. So, but yeah, definitely most of the time was William Sonoma and Pottery Barn. What was the biggest challenge going from an employee to the business owner? Realizing that you don't know everything that you think you know, that's probably been, you know, when you sit there and you work for corporations and they have you do something and you're like, oh, really? It's pointless. It's worthless. Why do I have to do this? I could do it so much better. And yeah, you definitely have to swallow your pride sometimes as a business owner. <laughs> what were some of the challenges when you, the first year you were open? The first year was pretty, we opened in September, so we had that fourth quarter that we were going into, which was key because there really wasn't time for too many problems. It's, it's the merchandise came in, the shelves were stocked, Christmas came, it was this huge like blow up of people in the store. And at that point I wasn't here, I was in a 400 square foot space over on the side by Dr. Mike's. And I think the biggest challenge was, and it was, it was bizarre, um, the, when they did Winterfest and the tree lighting, I was going home because my kids were still little. So I was going home to pick up my mom and the kids and bring them downtown. And I couldn't get out of the store. There, was so, there were so many people in the store that if I went to the right, I hit a traffic jam. If I went to the left, I hit a traffic jam. And to get out of this 400 square foot store it probably took me 20 minutes. And I remember being thrilled about that, but being like, oh, I'm, I probably should have gotten a bigger space. <laughs> And then definitely it's been a long learning curve with trying to figure out your budget and the merchandise. And I do have a spending problem and I do like to order merchandise and it's fun on so many levels. And, um, and I'm still working on that. <laughs> 11 years in, I'm in a pretty good spot, but um, yeah, it's still, it's a constant, um, I have to talk myself off at of the buying ledge quite frequently. <laughs> You're very active in the Bethel Chamber of mm -hmm. Commerce and around town. What do you see the benefit of doing that? Um, well, I think it kind of keeps you in the loop. You know what's going on and, and you get to see the changes and um, you kind of can help make a difference. So if you see 
things going a certain way, you have the ability to kind of band together and maybe get them to sway a different way. And but I think it's important to be involved in, in the community that you're in. And, and it's certainly, it was definitely, joining the chamber as a board member was definitely out of my comfort zone. I'm, I've never been in that environment, so that was the first thing, but I, I absolutely love it. So it's, it's great. So if someone was to come to you and say, I th- I'm th- I've never done it before, but I'm thinking opening a store in Bethel, mm-hmm. what recommendations would you give them? I would tell them that they, they should, I'm happy to talk to them and, um, and tell them my trials and tribulations, but they should probably go talk to somebody with more business experience. The part that I can help them with is it's absolutely great. It's a great community to be in. It's fun. The downtown's beautiful. It's getting prettier all the time. And if you want, which is what I wanted, the home small hometown feel, you get to know your customers, you're um, involved in things. If you want that, then definitely small town business is for you. If you're looking to get rich quick or expand or open up a million stores, you might want to look elsewhere. It's it's, unless you've got a ton of money, it's not going to happen branching off of of this little, like you can't use this necessarily as the launching pad for for other opportunities. which took me a while to realize. I definitely, I think about a year and a half ago, that was my kind of my turning point. Like, you know, it, I loved what I've been doing. It was always fun. I've never had any second guesses about doing it. Coming to work has never been a chore. But there definitely comes a time where you, you keep putting these numbers that you want to reach at year end. And that's your goal. And I thought, well, I'm not successful until I reach this number. And the reality is I can't reach that number. It's not, the town can't support it. It's not a realistic number. And so once I kind of stepped back from that and said, I need to just do what I'm good at. And I need to not worry about that, which is also why I don't worry about Amazon and Toys R Us and all those. I have to do what I'm comfortable doing and what I feel I'm good at doing. And I, I just can't let those be distractions. So I can't have that number figure. If I hit it someday, great. If I don't, then I'm not going to be disappointed. It's, it's, definitely been a great experience and and I I love it so where do you see the store in another 11 years I don't know that's yeah ideally I would love to be able to take over this whole block (laughs) I I yeah I can't I can't even begin to fathom where it could be I mean ideally it'd be nice to have another location at some point now is not the time in my life to look at doing that, but I would love to have a store in a city. I'd love to be in Boston or New York. Or I'm just, I'm a city girl at heart, so I love that energy. And but you know, I still have kids, and I have a mother that lives with us that I care for, and and so my place is here. So yeah, I haven't. It'd be nice to be able to maybe you know move a couple of walls out, and give myself a little more space. But um, I have great landlords, so I I will stay in this location as long as they'll have me. <laughs> Anything else you would like to share with the residents of Bethel? Oh, just that I love being here, and I thank them, of course, for their support. And, yeah, I hope to be here for many, many more years. Well, thank you very much for your time today. Oh, my pleasure. Yeah, it's been a lot of fun, so thank you. (laughs) You can visit the Toy Room at 153 Greenwood Avenue, Bethel, Connecticut. You can call them at 203-791-0531. Their website www.toyroombethel.com Thank you for listening to the Bethel Business Podcast. For more information about the Bethel Chamber of Commerce, call 203-743-6500 or visit discoverbethelct.com If you run a business in the Bethel area and are interested in being a guest on this podcast, contact Smith Douglas Associates at 203-628-2606.